Hi, a oh, very good morning all of you. Hope you guys are all doing good. So let's continue with our paper discussion video series part 12. So I hope you guys are all ready. So first we'll deal with the following topic. Heavy calculus, non-calculus formulas, difference in the composition of plaque in terms of mineral content. These are the keywords which you received. So as Kevin and Karan, let's review some information. Calculus is mineralized dental plaque. Saliva is source of mineralization for supragingival calculus, whereas for subgingival it is GCF, which is a serum transferred, as you're all aware of. The calcium concentration or content in plaque is 2 to 20 times that found in saliva. Early plaque of heavy calculus formers contain more calcium, three times more phosphorus, and less potassium than that of non calculus formers suggesting that phosphorus may be more critical than calcium in plaque mineralization. I hope this information is helpful in answering your query or let me know if you need any further clarification. Moving on, face mask duration of usage. So as you can see, face mask reverse pull headgear, which is used for correcting class 3 malocclusion. In case of retrognathic maxilla, the most common treatment for this problem in growing patient involves the use of reverse pull or protraction headgear with or without prior palatal expansion. The typical technique in face mask therapy is application of approximately 12 ounces of force on maxilla in a forward and slightly downward direction for 14 hours a day. I hope this answers it very. The orthopedic and orthodontic responses for this force include maxilla moving forward and downward along with its dentition, downward and backward mandible rotation, and retroclination of incisors of maxilla. All these improve skeletal discrepancies that would have contributed to class 3 malocclusion. And remember, protraction headgear is contraindicated in patients with excessive vertical development. Right? I hope it's clear. Now, let's move on to the next topic. OPG artifact, these are the keywords which you received. And as you can see, panoramic radiograph of an improperly positioned patient. Note the large radiopaque region in the middle of this radiograph because the patient has the neck angled forward. This ghost image of cervical spine could have been eliminated by having the patient sit straight and align or stretch the neck. So proper neck extension as given in White and Farrow. Proper neck extension is best accomplished by using a gentle upward force on mastoid eminences when positioning the head in a manner similar to applying cervical traction. Allowing patients to slump their heads and neck forward causes a large opaque artifact in midline created by superimposition of increased mass of cervical spine. This shadow obscures the entire symphysal region of mandible and may require that the radiograph be retaken. Now, moving on. Janeway lesions, as you can see, Janeway lesions on the foot, the sole of foot, as well as on palm of hand. So these lesions are painless macular hemorrhagic lesions that occur most commonly on palmar surface of hands and feet. These lesions are non-tender in contrast to exquisitely painful oscillar smooth. Most histologic studies of Janeway lesions have revealed dermal microabscesses without evidence of vasculitis. I hope this information is helpful. Let me know if you need any further clarification. Now, let's move on to the next topic, epinephrine in finger. Let's review some information relevant to this keywords or topic. So as you can see, it's often maintained that a local anesthetic, usually lidocaine with adrenaline, must not be used in fingers and toes because it may cause necrosis due to vascular spasm in end arteries. However, there are several uh, standard articles, pompid indexed articles, suggesting that there are no grounds for warning against using lidocaine with adrenaline in fingers and toes. Let me know if this information is helpful in answering your query. If not, we'll add additional information in the description part of this video. Okay. Now, moving on to the next topic, primordial prevention. These are the keywords which you received. So as you can see, it's a prevention of emergence or development of risk factors in countries or population group in which they have not yet appeared. Individual and mass education is main intervention method in case of primordial prevention. We discuss different levels of prevention, even in our study club discussions, right? Now, moving on to the next topic, apexification, apexogenesis. These are the keywords to receive. Let me know the context, and if you have any clues or hints related to the question, drop them in the comments. We'll provide you more clarification if needed. As you know, 
as we discussed already in our eight classes. Apexification is defined as a method to induce a calcific barrier across an open apex of an immature pulpless tooth. So these are the clues you have. The aim of apexification is to induce either closure of an open apical third of root canal or formation of an apical calcific barrier, as you can see, against which obturation can be achieved. Apexogenesis, on the other hand, is allowing physiological root development and subsequent closure. So apexogenesis is a physiological process of root development in a tooth. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next topic, superficial burns. So features of superficial burns, let's review some information. So as you can see, superficial first degree burns involves epidermis of skin only. It appears pink to red. There are no blisters and it is dry, moderately painful and superficial burns heal without scarring within five to 10 days. So I hope this information is helpful in answering your query. And also we have a classification of burns based on the extent of uh, the depth in what. So we have partial thickness, a full thickness. In partial thickness, we have superficial, that is first degree burns. And then superficial partial thickness, deep partial thickness, which fall under second degree burns. And then in full thickness, we have third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, and sixth degree, right? Now, moving on, drug interactions. So these are the keywords which you receive, ceftriaxone and warfarin. So as you can see, ceftriaxone potentiates warfarin activity greater than other antibiotics, thereby increasing the risk of bleeding. Also, cotramoxazole with warfarin leads to displacement and inhibition of metabolism with decreased production of vitamin K in gut, thereby increasing the risk of bleeding. So we have to monitor INR and reduce dose of warfarin. Some drug interactions, I hope this is helpful. Now, moving on to the final topic. So, we received the keyword non steroidal anti androgenic drug. So, flutamide it is. Flutamide is a non steroidal drug having specific anti androgenic but no other hormonal activity and some relevant information about flutamide. I hope this is helpful. And also we have mifepristone, which is also a non-steroid with potent competitive anti-progestational and significant anti-glucocorticoid as well as anti-androgenic activity. So all of these drugs, that is anti-androgens, anti-estrogens, estrogens, glucocorticoids fall under drugs altering hormonal milieu, right? So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video. Again, as I said, let me know if you need any further clarification in the comments below and provide us at least 24 to 48 hours to get back to you with additional information in the description part of this video. So I appreciate your understanding, love and affection always. I wish you all the best, love you all, have a fantastic day ahead. Take care.